Philippians is where we're at. Uh, we're taking the whole summer. We're reading a couple uh, books that are in the New Testament, um, some of Paul's letters that he wrote to some churches. Um, and I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the Bible, it gets really confusing. Um, I just don't know. I, I start to read and I'm like, what, this doesn't make sense. Um, that, was, that was early on. And even today, I, I still have stuff that I've got to go and figure out. And um, what you don't realize is that the church even though it has like access to all kinds of things, discipleship is really missing in the church. Like it's just, and, and what I mean by that is like people come to church and they hear a message on Sunday, but they don't know how to read their Bible or they don't know how to study it or they don't know the joy of it or they don't, you know, like it's not practical to them. And for me, I just have a burden for that. Like I have a burden uh, that people would know God's word. Like that they would understand it. So we're going through uh, Philippians, a chapter um, each Sunday. Last week, we started with Philippians chapter one. I'd really encourage you to go back and, and watch that because uh, it kind of leads us into chapter two. And just to give you a little backstory. Um, so your Bible, it says Philippians chapter one, um, and then it's got verses in there. And I have a pastor friend who there was a girl after a church service came down to the front and said, hey, I really like the words that you were reading on the screen. Uh, can you tell me where to find those? And he was like, honey, that's the Bible. Like, and she's like, oh, okay. Well, like, what is the person's name and then the number and then the dot, dot, and then the, and then the other number? And he's like, well, that's who wrote it. And that's like, the like, just didn't understand. So what I want to do is as we're doing this book study, that's kind of where I want to start. Like, if you don't know anything about the Bible, that's great for you. But if you know a ton about the Bible, there's stuff in there for you. Um, so Philippians is a book that Paul wrote while he was in prison. We found that out last chapter. Um, and he's writing this book to a church in Philippi. Philippi is a region. So Paul was an apostle or a church planner. So what Paul would do is he would go uh, to a town, a village, or a city, and he would preach Jesus to them. Hey, Jesus is the son of God, uh, born of a virgin, died a death that you deserve so that you could be, he preached the gospel to them. And then he'd set up a church structure and then he'd go to the next town. So he did that in this region called Philippi. And when he left, he wrote a letter called Philippians to them. And more than likely, so you can get a picture, Paul's sitting in a prison of some sort, probably in chains and shackles, and one of his disciples is there to visit him. And while he's, while, while he's, he's having a conversation uh, with whoever's visiting him, and this person's jotting down notes, and then it becomes scripture. So you're reading Philippians, Paul's book to a church in Philippi. That's what it is. But in the original writing, it was one continuous letter. It wasn't broken up into chapter and verse. So this is one continuous letter. We're breaking it up chapter by chapter so that we can study it. So Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 1, your version might say a few things different, but the concept will still be the same. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort in his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take, uh, but take an interest in others too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is infallible. It's the inspired, authoritative word of God. We love your word today. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We know that John says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's speaking of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word that represents seed and that our heart represents soil. Thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Show us which way we need to go. We ask today that you would encourage us by your word, uh, that you would correct us by your word, that you would rebuke us by your word, and that you would make us a, a better and a stronger follower of you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Probably a lot of your uh, versions um, will probably start out and use the word therefore. Uh, therefore. So that's a good break. And when they were breaking up chapter and verses, therefore, that, that was just like a good place to separate chapters. Um, when you see a therefore in your scripture, it's a good idea to figure out why it's therefore. So that's a good thing to remember. When you're reading scripture, when you're studying the Bible, if you see a therefore, circle it and then go back and figure out, okay, so why is this there for? So Paul basically at the end of chapter one gives some wording 
And then when he gives that wording, he shifts and he says, therefore, and then he gives a command or he gives something for us to follow. So let's go back to Philippians chapter one, just for reference, starting at verse 27. So this is the latter part of chapter one. We're getting ready to roll into chapter two. Remember, it's one continuous letter. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, uh, that you, uh, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And do not in any way be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them proof of their perdition, but to you of your salvation and that from God. For to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here uh, and now here is in me. Therefore, if, okay, so Paul's coming off of this and he's talking about there's going to be external things that are going to try to come against your faith. Have you noticed that following Jesus is not easy? Have you noticed that following Jesus comes with a little bit of difficulty? External difficulty being situations, conflicts, things that are out of your control. Has anything outside of your control ever inhibited on your relationship with Jesus? Anybody? A person, an external circumstance, a situation, something beyond your control that you can't do anything about. Anybody ever have any of that, okay. So that's what Paul's talking about here. Um, and if not, they'd be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them proof. So he's going through this idea and he's saying, when these external things come, stand strong in Christ. And then he goes on and he starts with what we're talking about today. Now, when all of these external things are going on, is there any encouragement in belonging to Christ? Have you ever felt that way? Like life is pressing in circumstances are coming in and you ask yourself this same question that Paul is ask, asking the church in Philippi. Um, is there any encouragement in belonging to Christ? If you've never been in this season in following Christ, just hold on, it's coming. There's going to be a time and a season where you're like, man, what, like, why is all of hell breaking loose in my life? I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying not to cuss. I'm trying not to I'm trying to read my Bible. I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to, but everything is coming against me. Everything that could possibly come against me is coming against me. And Paul's, Paul's asking these, these questions that he doesn't really need a response to. Is there any encouragement? Is there any comfort in his love? We just sang about the peace of Christ's presence. Is there any comfort? Is there any fellowship together in the spirit are your hearts tender and compassionate. So Paul's talking about these external circumstances and how some, sometimes they can come and they can become internal conflicts. External circumstances are trying to work their way into becoming an internal conflict. Have you ever seen or allowed external things to get you flustered on the inside? How many times has that happened to you? Things out of your control. I'll just use a really brief example. Many of you who are married, if your spouse has a, a disconnecting relationship with their parents, it would be your in-laws. How many of you notice about a week prior to getting around them, they're on edge? How many of you realize like when work situations and deadlines are coming up, you're wondering like, what, where did my spouse go? Why are you like, you're going nuts, you're going crazy. It's this external pressure that comes and it, it, it just kind of shakes us on the inside. And Paul's addressing that. And now he's going to move into how those external things, when they become internal, how to combat them. Okay. So Paul's going to give us some resources. When external things come internal and then internal stuff starts going wire, how do we combat it? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Make me happy. What makes Paul most happy is when the church is in agreement, when they have the same heart. Notice Paul says same heart, not same preference. There's a variety of preference in this room. Some people like this kind of music. Some people like that kind of music. Some people enjoy this kind of restaurant. Others enjoy this kind of restaurant. Some people like this environment. Some people like this environment. The beauty of the gospel 
is that it can take all of our preferences and bring us together under the umbrella of Christ. And there's beauty in togetherness. And Paul's saying, I want you to strive. I want you to strive together that you wholeheartedly are agreeing together. Not by the same preference, but by the same attitude. You have the same attitude behind things. I'll never forget when I did youth ministry and we were getting ready to go and do like a youth trip and we needed to use the, the church van. If you've ever been around church, you know horror stories of the church van. They smell like wet feet and little puppies, but stinky little puppies, not the cute puppies breath that, you, that we all, some of us like if you're weird. And I knew that I was going to use that van and put a bunch of kids in there and like I wanted it to be nice. So I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to clean the church van. So I pull the church van up. I take all the rows out. I get ready to start cleaning it. And I get in there and I start getting mad. You ever start to go clean something and you just find yourself getting mad because it's dirtier than what you thought and now you're just really not in the mood to do it? So I was doing that with the church van. It's these big bench rows. I was out there by myself. Nobody helped me. I was just suffering for Jesus, okay? <laughs> so I'm undoing this stuff, and I'm trying to get these big rows out of there. But I'm strong, so it's no problem. So I'm pulling them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'm pulling them out, basically breaking my back because I'm really not strong. I pull them out. I set them down. I get all these rows out. And then I start looking at the carpet. There's gum everywhere. There's hair everywhere. There's, like, trash everywhere. I'm like, this is gross. And it smells. So all of that together, and I'm just like, Lord, help me. Jesus. So I start working. I start vacuuming. And I start finding myself getting mad. And I went into it thinking, man, this is going to be so great. I'm literally earning treasure in heaven. Like, I'm going to go to heaven and, and God's going to go like this for me. You clean a church van. You're so good. And I remember as I was cleaning it, I didn't hear the Lord audibly. I've never heard his voice out loud. But have you ever felt that impression in your heart where it's like, you just, you just kind of got you know, taken behind the woodshed a little bit and the Lord just kind of gets on you a little bit. Um, I really just felt him impress on my heart. You get no reward for this. And I said, what are you talking about? I know the Bible. Yes, I do. I'm doing something for you. I get a reward. And he said, it's not about your action. It's about your attitude. Therefore, you get no reward for this. Because the Lord was trying to deal with me on the attitude. And when you and I see Paul writing about agreeing wholeheartedly, it's not about the action, but it's about the attitude. How many of you get frustrated when a decision is made beyond your head, but you've got to get behind it? It'd be best for you to just and get on the same page. Because you can go through Proverbs and you can read seven things that God hates. And it starts with those who sow discord among brothers. Paul's saying the truth of God's heart. He wants us to agree together. Now, you're going to notice I'm going to take my time up front because Paul takes about eight verses at the end just saying goodbye to two people. So we're not going to, that's just hard preaching. I don't care who you are. You can be T.D. Jakes. You can't preach on that. That's hard. <laughs> so I'm just going to, I'm going to spend my time up front and then tell you about Timothy and Epaphroditus. If you ever need a kid's name, right there it is, Epaphroditus. <laughs> Wholeheartedly each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. The world cannot stop a church who gets on the same page, who will work together, who will strive together, who will lay down their preferences and lift up the person of Jesus. There is no reason, like revival is there, it just needs the church to catch up. It just needs the people to get on board and to get behind what God is doing. Agreeing wholeheartedly, agreeing, loving, working together based on the same attitude, not opinion. And then this is where it gets real fun. So if you're a note taker or if you're easily offended, well, if, if you're a note taker, this will be great for you, but just be careful. If you're easily offended, just go like this for just a second if you want. He starts out strong. Don't be selfish. I'm selfish. Are you? I think we all are. But I think we all are to varying degrees. You know, there is no healthy form of selfishness. You know, God wants to work selfishness out of our life. And he uses people and circumstances to do it. 
And you know what we fight the most? People in circumstances. But we don't realize that that's God's surgery tool to get that out of your life. I always say this about marriage. Marriage is designed to kill you. Because if you've got a selfish bone in your body, it'll work on that one. But that's God's goal is, to, is for us to get selfishness out. And Paul's saying, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Well, all right. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out for only your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Let's meddle for just a second. Don't be selfish by trying, don't try to impress others. It took me a while, but I, I've, I finally got this down about preaching and pastoring. It's not my job to impress you with communication skills every Sunday. Early in ministry, I thought that that was the goal. You know, obviously I love Jesus and I wanted to share Jesus, but I also like I wanted to communicate really well. And there'd be Sunday after Sunday where, you know, I would, I, would, I would love when people say, man, that was like the greatest message ever. But I've gotten to a point now in my ministry where the greatest compliment is when people walk out and they're, they're saying something along the lines of, man, I really want to follow Jesus better. Man, I really want to read my Bible more. Man, I really want to pray more. My job as a pastor is, is not for me to come up and do a great job communicating. My job as a pastor is to get up and just exalt Jesus so high that everyone here is like, man, I want more of that. I don't want to hear more from this guy, but I want more about the guy who he's talking about. So when Paul's talking about not being selfish, Paul knows this because he's had to work this out. Paul admits he, was, he, he had covet in his heart. Like that's who he was. And he had to work on this. So he's saying, don't be selfish. And then he gives a couple things. Trying to make an impression. Selfishness is trying to make an impression and it's being focused on your own interest. So Paul's saying this, don't, uh, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. So Paul's saying, don't, don't be focused inwardly. And then he goes on and he says this, but be humble Thinking of others is better than yourself. Here's your homework for seven days. For the next week, I want you to find one person. It could be your spouse. It could be a coworker. It could be somebody. I want you to find one person. And I want you to put their name in your phone or on a sticky note or wherever you're going to see it. Okay? Everybody say yes. Gotcha. One person. One person. Jot their name down. Write it down. And for seven days... Think of them as better than yourself. And I know you are the all-knowing, great, mighty you. And that it's your world and we're just revolving around it. But just for seven days, if you could just come off the axis of holding the universe together for just a moment. And just put somebody in that place of, I'm going to serve you I'm going to think about you, think about others as better than yourself. And I love how Paul says this. He says, think about it, you know, because nobody is better than you. So you just got to kind of think it, you know, <laughs> he's saying, think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your interest, but take an interest in others too. So humility or humbleness is this thinking of others is better than yourself. Who this week can you think deserves better than you? Who this week can you think about that you can just make a goal and ambition to serve them without any consideration, without anything coming back? Just for seven days. And this isn't necessarily for them, but this is for you. How can you make a practice of what Paul's preaching about? You make a practice by finding a person and giving some time to thinking about them more than you. And what that looks like is, you know, maybe it's not the temperature in the house that you prefer, but maybe it's their preference. That's just, that's just simple. Maybe it's not done the way that you would want it to be done, but maybe it's how they prefer to have it done. Now, I know this is meddling a little bit, 
But how many of you in a workplace scenario, you've had a list of things to do, somebody else has a list of things to do, they go through their list of things to do, and then they get done, and they stand around and they look at everybody. That's not done. What if they got their list done, and then they looked around at everybody else and said, you know what, I think I'm going to help you. Who this week can you serve? Who this, who this week can you think of as higher than yourself? Paul goes on in verse 5, and he gives us the picture of humility. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. What was Christ's attitude? He was humble. A lot of people think that Jesus didn't have a personality. You haven't read the gospel because Jesus has a lot of personality. He would rebuke people. He would cry with people. He would celebrate people. He would flip tables in a situation. Like Jesus had an attitude, but the greatest attitude that Paul is trying to share with us here in this letter is Jesus's attitude of a humble servant. And look at the language that Paul uses about Christ. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. This is the number one exposer of cults. This is the number one exposer of things that are not based and rooted in Christian faith. They deny or circumvent the deity of Jesus Christ. Stay away from those people. Stay away from people who want to make Jesus low. Get around people who want to make Jesus high and exalted and lifted up. Jesus is God, co-eternal and co-equal. The Bible says that before the foundations of the earth were, were laid, that the lamb was there. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And nothing was created without him. God created man and he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Jesus is God. If Jesus wasn't God, he could not reconcile us back to himself. This is essential stuff for our faith. But he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. So he never lost his divinity. Jesus was always God in the flesh. But he, for, for a moment, allowed himself to push glory to the Father, to give us an example of how we should live. That's what Christ did. As a humble servant, even though he was God, and he could have been magnified and glorified and lifted up, and he could have had hosts of angels and called his disciples to serve and had a huge chair with a big ring and all kinds of diamonds. And Jesus said, I'm going to be born of a virgin in a stable, I'm going to be raised poor. People are going to be wondering about my dad. And I'm going to serve and I'm going to be a carpenter and I'm going to love people and I'm going to serve them. A lot of people think when we get to heaven, all we're going to do is serve Jesus and that's going to be a part of it. But you will be surprised Jesus serving you. That's going to be the number one thing that most people are surprised about when they get into heaven is the serving nature of Christ Jesus. And we'll lift him up, we'll magnify him, we will sing with hosts of angels. But you're going to be surprised when Jesus is serving. Because that's who he is, that's Christ's nature. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, not his personhood, but his privileges. Jesus willingly laid that aside. And he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to, to God and died a criminal's death. So Jesus said, I'm willing to follow God's plan for my life regardless of what it looks like. Regardless of the outcome, I, I trust and believe in God's plan for me. He's giving us a picture of what our life should look like in total surrender to him. 
on a cross. Notice it says that. And not only a death of a criminal, but on a cross. The Bible says, cursed be anyone who's hung on a cross. So Jesus died in, in cursed form. Therefore, here's another therefore. That's a good place to circle. God elevated him to the place of highest honor, highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names. That's the name that we were singing about today. Shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus, G everything, everything, every circumstance, every problem, every issue has to bow when Jesus is brought in because of his authority. Just because of who he is. Now, a lot of us, we, we don't have an understanding for, for what it looks like. But when Jesus walks in, everything is humbled immediately in that moment because he's so high. It doesn't matter if you lift him high. He is high. Therefore, we're low. And he immediately gets honor because God gave it to him. Gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, your father. I love how in verse five, after reading all of that, Paul doesn't say, hey, if you feel like it that day, you should have the attitude of Christ, a humble servant. Hey, if things are going well for you, you should try to have Christ's attitude. Hey, if, if you're waking up on the, on the right side of the eggs and bacon, it'd be a great day to just, no. He says, you must. You, that's a command. Paul's commanding us to have this humble nature. And this is what Paul is trying to push to the church in Philippi. Like as he's, as he's going through this letter, he's transitioning and he's saying, I want you guys to have the same heart. I want you guys to work and strive together with one mind and one purpose. The only way to accomplish that, because you've had external circumstances that now has called for internal frustration. The only way to overcome all of that is if you humble yourself. You want to know how to get out of an argument in your marriage really quick? Humble yourself. You know what, babe? You might be right. And I might be wrong. And I'm sorry. You know, you, you know how, to, how to smooth things over and not just passively at work? You know what? I didn't, I didn't come into work yesterday with the greatest attitude that I could have had. Make a practice of humbling yourself. I was always kind of a little crazy as a kid and my mom and especially like my grandma thought that it was their God-given assignment, their duty from heaven to bring humility into my life. So um, you have somebody that does that for you? It's probably a kid, <laughs> but it's like, it's like their God-given role to make sure that you're humble. Well, it, it was my, my grandma, her name was Nanny and she was crazy. Just keep her in your prayers. Every time that we would go to a Chinese restaurant, she said that it was family tradition and Chinese custom for the youngest person at the end of dinner to get on the table and to do a traditional Chinese dance. <laughs> so ask me what I did <laughs> at every Chinese buffet restaurant from about six until 10. I got my traditional Chinese dance at every, and everybody would look, and I never saw another youngest kid do it ever. <laughs> but I was humble after doing that. What is one thing that you could do in your life to humble yourself? Maybe it's apology. Maybe it's serving somebody. Maybe it's doing something without getting any kind of recognition, something that you do and you actually don't post it on Facebook. What is, what is one thing that you could do? What is one person that you could serve? Verse 12 picks up and says this. Dear friends, you always follow my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important, important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep, deep reverence and, free, and fear. So let's just, let's just work this one verse at a time. You've always followed my instruction when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. You know, the, the, the test of what you truly believe is when nobody's watching and when nobody's around. 
because that, that begins to reveal your integrity. That reveals like what's, what's really going on on the inside. When nobody's checking in, when nobody's watching, when, nobody, when you don't have another meeting to show up and make sure that you get a box checked off or somebody's looking over your shoulder or micromanaging you, who you are when nobody is looking is the sum total of who you are. And Paul's saying, I, I need you to follow this, especially more when I'm away. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, not work to earn salvation. The Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. So Paul's not saying works so you can earn salvation. But Paul's saying since you've been saved, it should result in some kind of a work. There should be a working out of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you. God is working in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I'll just say it slower so we all can get it. God is working in you. When you're in Christ, it's not even you working, it's God working in you. It's not you wanting to read the Bible. It's not you wanting to go to church. It's not you wanting to try to live better. It's not you wanting to do that. It's God in you. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of death to self and life to Christ is that now it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the hope of glory. Christ, that's the gospel that God is in you, and he just wants to get out. So it's the power of God who's working in you, giving you the desire. Your desire for godly things comes from God, not you. And the power to do what pleases him. How many of you want to please God? Okay, so let's say that that's the seat of the stool. The seat of the stool rests on the desire, the want to, and the power, the ability, and God gives you both legs of that stool. He gives you the desire, the want to, the heart, and the power. Today celebrates what happened over 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, go and pray and tarry and wait, and then I will send you the Holy Spirit the comforter, the teacher, and he will not only just be with you, but he'll live in you. That's the power. That's the power of God that's living on the inside of us now. And it's not for perfect people, but it's for hungry people. He said, go and wait and pray, and then you will receive power. Do everything without complaining and arguing. That's a great verse to make your home screen for about three or four weeks. Do you do everything without complaining or arguing? Everything. Just take inventory. Are you a complainer? Do you argue? Paul's saying don't do that. So that no one can criticize you. If you're complaining and arguing, you could be criticized. Live clean, innocent lives, as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Complaining and arguing is the, the start of that. If you, if you will quit complaining and arguing, you, you'll live a clean, innocent life, and you're not going to look like crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. What is the word of life? It's God's word that he gave to us. Then on the day of Christ returns, Christ is coming back. I will be proud of you. So Paul's saying, I'm going to be proud of you if you hold to his word. And he's going to know that he didn't run his race in vain, but that his work uh, was actually useful and not just useless. Then he says, but I rejoice if I lose my life, I'm pouring it out, just like all of us are pouring out our service to God as an offering. All offerings require some kind of sacrifice. And I want you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share with your joy. Then there's a couple see you laters that Paul writes. And I just want you to kind of know a couple characters here. Timothy, and then read what Paul has to say about Timothy. This guy proved himself, he was faithful. So he says, it, it's, so, it's so awesome how Paul writes his letters. He says, you know, don't be selfish, be humble like Christ. And then he says, quit complaining and gossiping. And then he highlights two people that live this out in their life. Timothy, his faithful and beloved spiritual son. Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father and has served me with preaching the good news. 
So Timothy's life has been produced by this gospel. And then he goes on and he talks about Epaphroditus. There's a couple things about Epaphroditus that I wanna share with you and then we'll wrap up. He is a true brother, a coworker, and a fellow soldier. A brother speaks to the relationship that him and Paul enjoyed. A worker speaks that there was a job to be done and a soldier speaks that there's a, a battle to be fought. Then he goes on and says that Epaphroditus was the messenger sent by the church in Philippi to him and that it brought him great joy. What we learn out in, in chapter four, as we keep reading is, is Paul was brought an offering by the church in Philippi and Epaphroditus is the one who brought this offering, money. Paul was in a situation, he didn't have means for anything. This church in Philippi took up an offering for Paul and Epaphroditus brought it and brought it to him in his lowest moment. Will you do me a favor and stand with me? I love how Paul ends this chapter highlighting two people. And I just wanna take this whole sermon and bring it to the cross. That's my, that's my goal in every message is to just bring everything to the cross. Timothy was a faithful servant, looks just like Jesus, was a friend that sticks closer than a brother, was with him in the pit, was with him, just stuck by his side. Timothy gives us a picture of Jesus's humble service to Paul. And then Epaphroditus who brought this offering to, to Paul in his lowest point. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. In our lowest point, he brings us something of joy. He brings us something of benefit. Paul's writing this letter. He's like, look, these external conflict, don't let it become internal. But if it does, here's how to combat it. You've got to use humility. Once you have humility, let's just look at the greatest picture of humility. It's Jesus Christ. When we understand that Jesus Christ is the greatest picture of humility, let me show you how the gospel worked in two people's life, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And then for us, what does that mean when we walk away? Well, we just read Paul's letter. So what should we do? We should serve somebody this week. How can I serve you? I love Chick-fil-A. How may I serve you? I will have a Oreo milkshake in Jesus' name. No cherry, extra whip. Serve that up. What can you do for somebody this week? How can I serve you? How may I serve you? Because it's a privilege. It's an honor to serve people. Father, we thank you.